Just think in your minds about the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities that you face with the individuals in your learning community around pure learning. If you can divorce that from standardized curriculum, if you can divorce that from testing, and just think about the people in your midst and think about the greatest opportunity. Like every, and with what they're undergoing now, I mean, compared to what we went through when we went through, it's still so much. I mean, you see the strict number of jobs that they have outside of here. And that's one of the big things that I've struggled with is getting the kids to have that time they're able to set aside with so much going on. For sure. I agree with that. Matt, what was one observation either on the challenge or opportunity side? Uh, I've seen that challenges. The first thing that came to my mind is uh, language. And, uh, whether it's speaking skills or writing skills, or just trying to remember to communicate with the kids are thinking and trying to get it out to people in a way that makes it so that people actually latch on to it. Right. So when the kids are actually producing their own yeah. work, cool. I say cool because I, I have a couple ideas on that because it's wrong. Here. I'm going to say just to add a little to that, um, I wrote down kind of like, you know, we have students in our classroom or in our school who come to us uh, with not the same tools in their toolbox. And so kind of the whole thing of access and equity, it's, it's a challenge because you're limited with time. Right. Right. So how do you get around that? And you have the classic individualism versus equality question, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's just a new teacher, but uh, budget was a big challenge for me. Um, it, I think it's just hard if you have you have so many students and you want to bring them to a certain level, and if you're only going by what the textbooks giving you, you know, you have to bring out these outside sources. And for kids that don't have computers or don't have the time to go to the computer lab and check it out, it's hard to take them to that next level. So for me, I try to provide as much as I can, but with what we're given, it it makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. So that didn't require money is the important part the fiscal resources that would enable them access to tech or is the important part being able to connect them with the information? Probably connecting them with the information. Okay. That helps. Thanks. Okay. Sort of to play off that, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm well aware of all the information in the, at, the, at the fingertips, but it's getting the kids to, you know, at least at our school, my school, you know, PB, you know, uh, and all our schools for that matter, getting to go from your classroom and to keep working, like you said, you know, to, 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 to pursue that outside and, um, yeah, we go into the computer lab and those, you know, the kids that don't have the computers at home, that don't have the access at home, that don't have the thing. And the same thing, that's the challenge that goes with that is, you know, if they don't buy in enough to what you're selling them to go to the computer lab to work on that assignment or, uh, so the same sort of idea. <laughs> Dave, I think that was something that was, when I was first time, I was thinking about the kids. One well, of the problems I do run the, the kids in the equal access back at home. Mm -hmm. That yeah. really is a struggle, and I mean, as we've talked about this plenty of times, uh, here, I kind of get a feel for what you're doing. It's it's really a frustrating thing to run into, and it's not through any fault of their own at all, sure. but just having the ability, and it works well. I mean, you look at my content area, yeah, they have to run linear regressions with their things, and, and their data from labs, and it's not easy for everyone to do that. Some of them have to come in and use my resources, and that works great at that level, but it's even tougher when you get to the other levels that are a little. Uh, lower than that, and that when the engagement is already at 100 percent, 110 percent. Right. And we also have the issue at high school level of how much safety and security are we trying to provide so that we feel like we're not being negligent in some way, but how do we also prepare them to become more independent and seek those resources out because access is a fairly easy solution given the spectrum of solutions out there. We can't solve poverty, can't solve racism, but you can really solve access to an electronic tool to get your schoolwork done. And if you're not able to solve that, that's worth a really good conversation. So, most professional development, we already have the culture, right? Look how we sat. Some of these habits are kind of hard to break. We're going to be breaking them over the next two meetings. For today, though, let's just break a few things at a time. One is the expectation that you go to a professional development meeting, to get an out-of-the-box solution or strategy that you then go paint by numbers and do the exact same thing and replicate results or more realistically go, there's another binder for the shelf. <laughs> We're not going to do that. 
you ever read those creation myth stories like from Google or Amazon or any of these companies? Twitter is the most famous recent one where you have this wild success, it gets covered in the media, and then people want to know how it started, and it's always this one weird conversation in a room somewhere. <laughs> what if this was that conversation? That's the spirit I want to take this opportunity to think about out loud. If we get this right, we can replicate for free learning experiences that don't really rely on technology, but that amplify and accelerate what we do through technology, so that we can demonstrate Common Core, No Child Left Behind, all these other initiatives have been trying to get at how do we account for the unaccountable? How do we account for things like creativity and collaboration and critical thinking and communication? So what I'd like to do is go through a couple theoretical ideas, connect them to the resources that I share with you in advance of the meeting. Uh, it, it will be a little bit of a stand-up dog and pony show just to kind of share the story and how I developed this and, and what we're all going to talk about. And then uh, Miranda and Lester are here not just as champion videographers to help us curate because if I had my druthers and budget wasn't an issue, this would be a fully blown out internet studio that would be completely transparent to the public all the time. That to me is the best way to take a fearful public and bring them into a world where learning can be chaotic and messy, but great things happen. And the only time we see it in the public discourse is like the traffic report when there's an accident. The rest of the time, it's humming along pretty well. And whatever your theories about the policy of public education and all that, we can get into some of that as we go. Where does, where does open source come from? Are you guys familiar with the phrase at all besides just seeing it all over software and that kind of stuff? Do you know what open source is? Uh, if you ask him O'Reilly, yes, it is. Um, he's made a lot of money talking about things like 2.0 and open source. And they really kind of coined the phrase in the last few years. And the idea was, traditionally, Aaron teaches econ, you build a business, you build an out-of-the-box enterprise piece of software, and you sell it as the author, and that transaction means I get to use what you give me, and you give me money in exchange. Open source works differently. Open source is the idea that you put all the code online for everyone to see and you allow everyone to contribute to the solutions and make it better because, after all, there's no book ever written that doesn't have a typo in it. So one of the guys that um, that speech Cory Doctorow gave, Cory's also a science fiction author and he's trying to write the first book that's never had a typo. So he let everybody look at all the text and edit it and after seven years, somebody finally found one more typo and they're still at it. And so when we think about things we take for granted and how we assess quality, no one person can do anything as well as a bunch of people can. That's the open source software movement. So you have like Linux and Unix and all that stuff. I didn't take this from software. I actually took it from a little bit closer to where you live, Colin, and, and thermodynamics. An open source system, and I'm going to ask the expert to correct me if I'm wrong in this, doesn't just exchange light and heat with its environment, it exchanges substance and sometimes even purpose. And so when you think about it, as soon as Aaron walked in, the whole dynamic of the room changed, even if just for a moment. So when we're in conversation, things change when you add people to that network. You're driving your car, you see a police officer all of a sudden in the rearview mirror, you are physically, psychologically, and behaviorally altered, right? All of a sudden you're worried that you're gonna get a ticket, palms get sweaty, your breath quickens, your heart skips a beat, your hands are attentive to you, you're checking your seatbelt and radio. We went from a one-to-many broadcast in network media to a point now where people are sharing information all throughout the network. And when you think about it, this model, well, <coughs> the model where you have one person in front and all the people in the back, you saw that article that I wrote with the medieval classroom and then the computer labs. Why do we have that model? Because we borrowed it from the medieval universities that started in the 1300s when you only had a few thousand illuminated manuscripts and they were all worth stealing, so you had to chain them to the front of the room. Now that that's not the case, and I agree with you about textbooks, what do you do in that environment? Now, school does a lot of things really, really well. I'm not going to go out and build a football stadium or have a library or you know, multiply for campus, and we've got all this infrastructure, but there's also things that school isn't built for, and school really isn't built for networked communications. Eyes on your own paper, do your own work, use your own words, and then the first thing we tell people when they go to work is, why can't you be a better team player? So when we think about how to prepare people for that environment, we first have to let go of a lot of our assumptions. 
Um, I really thought when I came back to teach in high school, and those of you who don't know this, I taught at UCLA for 11 years. And I came back to teach because all my consulting clients and all my UCLA students would normally say to me, you know, I, I had to recover from my education just to survive in my job and succeed in my life. And I think every generation complains about school, so you take it with a grain of salt. But with No Child Left Behind and the standardization, I got curious and came back to teach. And what I found was pretty freaking disturbing. Like most people, I wanted to save paper and, and make things more interesting and more colorful and show that I was you know, not just a creature of the 20th century and all that. And then I realized that that's not good enough. We're stuck in Zeno's paradox. You guys know what that is? Zeno was an Athenian philosopher before Socrates and, and basically said, if you have point A and you've got point B, and you take steps from point A to point B, but each step is half the distance of the last step that you took, you're never going to get there. It's like training for a marathon by trying to eat one less Twinkie. Because the siloed curriculum that we have doesn't map to the way people think. We think all over the map. We think in terms of interdisciplinary all the time. And you think your thought patterns and you go, oh, that reminds me of this thing. Oh, yeah. That's the way we normally think. And when we're kids, we ask lots of questions. Now, most of this is pretty well you know, cut and dried. I'm not saying anything that's cutting edge or new. But what is new in the last three or four years is that now people are sort of getting comfortable with blogs. They're getting comfortable with websites. If I would have given this talk, I actually did give slight little pieces of this to people along the way while I've been here. If I gave the whole thing four or five years ago, I'd have been fired. There's no way people would have said, you can't go, you can't let kids go on the internet. That's where porn and gambling lives. They won't do the right thing. I'm taking a huge risk, they would say, by putting all my stuff up online. I'll show you a couple links to illustrate what I'm talking about in a few minutes. But at this point, my students are aware of the core curriculum, and yet don't have any bearing on the height or the color of the wildflowers. You are all going to do things according to what you see fit you. Unlike most professional developments, I really want to give you guys a way to benchmark your current practice first so that you can say, yeah, you know what, I'm sort of mindful of this and this is consistent with what I do. I also want to make sure that I'm giving you something new so that you can make this worth your while and also have a community to bounce ideas off of. And then lastly, hey, I may say something you go, that doesn't, I don't understand, what are you talking about? And that's fair game. Has to be. So, on the first day of school, I tell students that we've got a choice. And it can't be my choice. We have all this technology that connects them with all the knowledge and media that humanity has to offer online. And now people feel like they're joining a tradition, so I'm less worried about it than I was. But I leave the room when I do this. I lay it out, set a March day, but then in between, uh, and I'm open to platform. We can use Google Groups. I've set up number blogs for you on this blog, which I'll show you before we leave. But I'd like to maintain some continuity, and I've already asked John Davis for some release time so that I can visit your classrooms and you can visit mine. Um, he's willing to go ahead and do that. So let's just figure out what works and sustain momentum between you. If the students understand the prisoner's dilemma, theoretically, I could walk outside. I've only given them the one assignment. They could keep me out all semester and get their A's and literally never bring me back in. Fortunately, they don't really understand the prisoner's dilemma, and they don't really care because they're so into this from the word go. If you look at the uh, comments when you get this, and you have some leisure time to look at it at home, if you haven't heard that phrase yet, that's the new coming wave, that 3.0. You've got Bluetooth, you've got a locator, you've got Wi-Fi, you're sharing all sorts of data about you right now. And a lot of that data is NSA style, but a lot of it's corporate. And all of it is for sale. So when we think about the value of our data, and we've got these great policies now, you know, Cal Poly just has these new uh, university economic objectives. I don't know if you can see them from there, but it's think critically and creatively, communicate effectively, and a lot of this is word salad. It's the same stuff as the common core. When you get right down to it, we are products of our working environments, processes, and tools. And a lot of the time, I find myself, and Lester and Miranda, bear me out on this, I have to talk people into a higher degree of confidence than they feel. And I have to talk them into a much higher degree of trust than they feel for someone like me who's standing with that role of teacher because the brand of school is toxic. If school were a sales model, then we get the most profitable demographic in human history attending school. 
and they're walking away, they're jumping the fence to run from law enforcement to escape a free, comprehensive, and potentially life-saving service. If this was a corporation, it would have been dead and buried a long time ago. So this image you're familiar with. Um, when we have a working environment here, this is a picture from class. Very frequently when people walk by my room, they have no clue what's going on. It doesn't look like a traditional class. Now sometimes it does. Today we had a perfectly traditional Socratic seminar on Brave New World. Um, the core elements of the curriculum are still very much in evidence because, number one, I like my job and I like providing health insurance for my family. Number two, we all understand that the students have to be responsible for very particular outcomes in expository composition and have to be able to analyze nonfiction text. But just intuitively, you look at student outcomes and you can see in real time evidence not just of their critical thinking, creativity, communication, etc. You also see their aesthetic, their sense of humor, who they really are. Some of them have challenges that we didn't know about. Some of them have, you know, crazy relatives who are doing amazing things in the professions that we just hadn't met before. So once we get through the moment where students go, yes, and I'm also mindful that, so here we are in near March. It's not like you're going to redesign your classes anyway. When I think about sitting in your shoes, it would be awkward to sit in shoes, but sitting in your seats, I think, well, all right, so how could I do a microcosm of open source learning in my class right now? It might be as simple as you walk in and go, hey, you know what? The next chapter deals with such and such. But I'm not sure this is the best resource out there. Now, this is going to be a little messy and chaotic, but I'm wondering if we could find a better way to look at this. And I'm inviting you to be, as your students, I'm inviting you to be my colleagues in that curricular decision-making process. That sounds like a mouthful, but I'm asking you to help me decide what we read and what we look at. Because none of you learn exactly the same things in the same way at the same time. That's the biggest challenge we have. No matter what system, one size will never fit all. Even throwing the decision making open in that regard, or, you know what, here's the lab that I had in mind. This is the way we traditionally represented it. Does anybody have a better idea? Or better yet, when we do our rotations, if we get the release time that John's promised and we actually make that happen, I would love to come in and teach a physics class. Am I doing it better than that guy? How do I know? We have a $12 billion self-help industry in this country because people graduate K through 12, K through 20 really, without an understanding of how things like emotions, and trauma, and anything else in their lives enhance or interfere with their ability to think and feel to their potential. Now, I'm not getting into that kind of, that's not my expertise, I leave it to Eric. But the thing of it is, to start the conversation with the students so that they understand there's an opportunity there and they can become more insightful. What Miranda said about their learning styles, each and every student has to at some point reflect on their own best way of learning for the simple reason that they have to make choices about the media they use and the stories they tell and how to learn stuff. But without a sense of who you are and what you're doing here, this is hard stuff, man. Are we talking about the to-do list? When I applied for UCLA, I remember all these you know, nice, kindly, elderly types who would say to me, man, it's got to be hard to apply to college these days. I'm them now. I look at our students, get out of 4 6, cure cancer, run a 4 4 40, volunteer at the hospital, and do all these other things and all this paperwork in the meantime. And that's just if you're like in the successful part. If you're challenged by family or poverty or other issues where you've got to like, make up for them, it's pretty unrealistic to expect that they can manufacture that motivation on their own. And I've got seniors right now, and it is the season. After this next rainstorm, when it gets warmer again, it's going to be almost impossible to extrinsically motivate them. And there are ways of self-reporting this data. The other thing I like about Blogger or WordPress or Tumblr is that they're democratic in the sense that they're free to the end user. And the end user, you know, don't get me wrong, if you're using something for free online, you are the product. I really like the idea. last two years, I really has got into Twitter more than just being an observer and kind of getting the information, but now I'm putting stuff out there and interacting. And um, the, the personal or uh, professional development I'm getting out of it, and like, like you said with these blogs, nobody's telling me what I have to look for or get. I have an idea or some student comes to me with some issue, 
it makes me think, well, hey, let's see what other people have done. And now I'm following different school counselors from Virginia, from Chicago, from, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, Alaska, you know, and as I put certain things out, then they're, they're oh, this person's starting to, you know, put things out, so they start following me. Is it just that interaction, to, you know? I think that's great, Eric. Has anyone used a, a Twitter fall in your class? You know what I mean when I say that? Using a hashtag? So, and as you see these elements when you go through these links, this is where I want you guys to drive the consumer bus. When you see something you like, all you gotta do is ask, and I'll be happy to give you the how-tos and show you how I use it and, and why. So, you can see where it says tweets about uh, hashtag DP lip comp. You know why he said nice going, Kevin? Because one of my students, Matty Hill, posted this picture of Kevin Lake sitting in Orchid Burger while he was supposed to be in my class, but period. <laughs> But before that, um, if you look at these, these are all with the hashtag DP lit comp. And I've embedded this on the blog, but you could also set up another projector so that while you're talking in class, I don't know about you all, I don't have a problem with keep people having their devices out. The basic ethos for all of this has to be trust. This is the ultimate faith-based initiative. I have to believe in human nature that most of the time, most of the people, are going to do most of the right things whether I tell them to or not. If I don't believe that, to be honest with you, I feel like I'm in the wrong profession. I feel like we have to trust our students at least a little bit. Emerson said, treat men great and they'll prove themselves great. This is my experiment. So far in three years, I'm standing by it. But what I was going to say is if you feel comfortable and the students can have their phones out in class, while you're lecturing or while you're in discussion, they can be contributing to a hashtag in the Twitter fall so that even though they don't have to interrupt you every single time or they may not feel comfortable asking that question, they can have that entire conversation in multiple channels without disrupting the flow of the in-person experience. And that's one of the examples about how to connect the network in real time. Now, when we're not in class, you can see there's a lot of tabs on this, but one I want to just bring up to you is the number of blogs. And this is where Literally, our work is open to the public. Um, I was in 99.1 studio yesterday with uh, Jay Turner and, and a week from Saturday morning, I'm not gonna publicize. Eric will tell you, I'm low profile on this campus. I think everybody else in the world knew what I was doing before this campus did, only because, and it's not that I wanted to keep it secret, it's just that all of us have so many demands on our time and there's so much pressure, and sometimes politics, that I didn't want to go out and say, hey, look what we should do. If people like what they hear and want to come, cool. But next Saturday morning, it's going to be on. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because he invited everybody to the blogs and then invited everybody in. And the way we met each other was through a U2 song that was on the radio. And so imagine my delight when I discover that there's a U2 band member who plays keyboard and does the computer programming who lives here on the Central Coast and happens to have met one of my students who happened to invite him to class. So on March 11th, he's coming in. And the links that I showed you on our blog map pretty closely what I did for us. And I, if it's OK, I should ask you, because I want to do this the same way I do with my students or learners. And um, I don't want to add work. But what I'd like to ask is that we set this up in the same way that I've set my class up, just so that you can, it's kind of like playing chords on a guitar. I want you guys all to be able to solo and jam and, and be spontaneous. But to begin with, I think it might be useful, especially since these meetings are going to be so far apart. I set us up with a page for our member blogs. But right now, there's no links, and there's no Aaron yet. But if you wouldn't mind, and choose your own platform. Do something that works for you, whether it's Tumblr, WordPress, Blogger, if you want to do a site, Weebly, wherever we can see what you're doing. And if you already have something, cool, link to that so we can learn from you too. Classroom. My fears were the adults. This presentation of the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, because that was the community that was ready to hear about it, and I won an award. And I didn't come back here and say anything about that. Um, now that it's changed so much, and we sort of accept it online as part of, you know, education. I don't really have any nervousness at this point. The only thing I'm nervous about is that so many people are starting proprietary online initiatives and the Gates Foundation is driving this common core because they have this data solution and everything. I'm worried that people get lost in the word salad. I'm, I'm worried that people 
use all these terms so fluidly that they lose their meaning. For me, open source learning has a very specific meaning. A few people have been nagging me to write the book as soon as I find that kind of time cool. But I think that teachers have a golden opportunity right now to tell a story, and so do learners, that creates instant value. When you curate, you know, for example, if you put up something about this meeting today, you're instantly creating value for yourself and for everybody who reads your stuff. For yourself, because they associate it with you, you're enhancing your online brand. So if you're a student, well, you've got something to balance out with goofy red cup pictures, but you've also got evidence of your talents and your qualifications. Um, yeah, I guess when I started, I was a little nervous about what I put online, too, and would I be judged for that. And what I realized is it's hugely important to be a courageous role model to make mistakes and put stuff up online. I'd probably become a, a nicer, more intentional communicator, because every line of every email, I use Maddie's, I didn't realize it had an acronym, but, you know, what will mom be think? And if I do see this on a billboard by the side of the 101 or on the front page of the paper, how does that play? Am I really being compassionate and understanding where people are coming from? The biggest challenge, you can ask me this, but the biggest challenge that I've had, first year I did this, I remember coming in and asking students, and what's the stereotype, man? You give teenagers a little bit of freedom and they're supposed to run with it. And these guys were all sitting in there like, that that our students are. Is so true? <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't even that. It was like, I, I thought it was motivation. I thought it was just like, pushing back and being difficult because now I was saying this and they're going to I didn't know what it was. And I realized that they had just never been asked much. Their curiosity is so atrophy in class by the time they get to high school that it's almost too late. All the research says that we ask hundreds of questions before those kids. My daughter's almost five. I have that living experience. By the time they get to high school, you know, the hands do like this over the years to the point that they're just totally disenfranchised. And now, most of them can't really get the hell out of here. So a big part of this was me having to be more patient. And you can tell from the way I talk. I mean, I like to do things fast, and I like to do things well, and I, that's the environment that I thrive in. But I really had to dial back my expectations and be gentle. Now, over time, some of this stuff <coughs> online doesn't look great. You look some, some of the member blogs and some of my courses, and it's like, where is that kid? I got a brilliant 3D <coughs> being in my classroom, and they put this online the same way that in the old days they would have turned into work. The same results. That happens. And that's a story we're talking about because now if family comes in and want to have a conversation with mom, all I gotta do is turn on my phone or bring my laptop and go, huh. we're looking at the same scoreboard and I'm really just as stumped as you are happening to have. So I hope I answered your question. I kind of ran through it as I was thinking. Do you approach the class any different, whether it's AP kids and that type of clientele versus uh, college prep? No. Um, I do the same thing with writing interventions. <coughs> and my reason is simple. When I came here, there was a lot of quality control around AP. In fact, they won't put the reason for the lawsuit. And at first, I really agreed with the idea that people should be pre-qualified. Can you read well? Do you want to read well? You know, those kinds of basic things. Then what I realized is, I don't know if this is true at Santa Maria's campus or at PD, but we have really kind-hearted, gentle people here. We want, you know, they prioritize relationships, and that's a good thing, we value in that. I think sometimes that comes across as don't stress yourself out in the program in the classes. And a lot of students who are capable weren't being put in the higher achieving classes because of whatever the expectations were. So for me, I wound up going the exact opposite route and saying, to some of my American Lit College prep students say, you know what, you can next year. And to some of the students who are in my expository comp class now, you don't have to take a class to take a test, come play with us. So I really wanted to blur as many boundaries as I could possibly. We talked about the walls of the classroom earlier. I don't recognize them. I don't care who's in what class. Anybody wants to learn something, we've got a fully functioning network 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you want to come join us on campus, we can make that happen too. I've had people join the course from all over the world. Eight-year-old in North Carolina. Our students are collaborating with Stanford students, London School of Economics students, UCLA students. Uh, and then earlier, Brian mentioned that a group of students is coming back to do a panel discussion live. We're all freshmen in college, all over the country. And 
I feel like expanding on these answers because different people have asked different versions of these questions. Since we only have a one hour hit, I'm trying to think of what might occur to you later. But this is the best example. When we leave this meeting and I think about what I should have said, and you think about what you should have asked, that's learning. And that's part of the reason this becomes so valuable is that it gives us a place to have those conversations even though they're not synchronous. Uh, but anybody can do this. Anybody can learn. Yeah, the reason I asked is you mentioned that back to the curiosity, right? Some mm -hmm. students are, have that curiosity built in or have learned it or have been, been fostered, right? And I see that a lot more with AP level students. And then college prep students, at least that I have, it's a lot more of the, and so that's my question in terms of have you had the structure anything different to how you deal with still tech that some are going to naturally be engaged I didn't have a false negative with college prep this year on the period of zero and one. And that's rough for a whole different set of reasons. But I do see that. And yet, and you guys bear me out on this, Miranda, I'm not sure. Um, if I'm going to generalize, and it's all this stuff, because we've got a wide variety of personalities. But if I were to generalize, I would say that the AP students, if they have a challenge, it's stepping out of what they've been told. Because the reason that they've been successful is that they've gotten really good at taking tests and following directions and getting ahead. 